Okay, so I think we can get us started. Uh, but before, just a small thing in Japanese for our Japanese uh, friends. So, um, uh, Nihongo um, あ、日本でたぶん、あ、間違いがあれは、あ、すみません。あ、このプレゼンテーションは全部、あ、英語ですけど、あ、ポウェポウェポイントの中で、あ、少し日本語 Okay. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, let's switch now to English. <laughs> okay. So, um, thank you so much for being here and for attending to my talk. Uh, today's presentation is about challenges and opportunities for Asia Pacific OSPOS. Uh, so first, a little bit of myself. Um, I'm the OSPO program manager at Tudu Group. For those unaware, to Tudu, uh, Tudu is a, a project uh, within the Linux Foundation focused on open source program office. We are a group of open source program office practitioners that are working on resources, tooling, uh, and more ways to create uh, sustainable and effective open source initiatives within organizations. Previously to that, I was at Viterja. Um, that was a software development analytics firm. Uh, and in there, I uh, focused and specialized in open source and inner source uh, metrics uh, and how to help uh, organizations to the metrics model. Um, uh, two years ago, I think, yeah, two years ago now, uh, I finished my master's degree in data science. And um, right now I'm involved in other open source communities, not only Tudu, uh, but as Master Jay Khan also in OpenChain, uh, that is also sponsoring uh, this, um, this um, room. Uh, Chaos uh, for open source software development analytics metrics. Uh, DevRel Collective and Inner Source Commons. Um, so this will be the agenda of today. Um, so first we will uh, give you some welcome on to OSPOCon, to this track. Uh, then we will move to the OSPO evolution uh, and share some of the challenges and opportunities based on the uh, latest uh, survey we conducted into the group. And finally, some recommendations for those that are uh, thinking about starting an OSPO or in the first stage of building the its OSPO. And during the whole presentation, we will have uh, the OSPO mascot that is called OSPO T because it's like OSPO and Mochi. So like for me, it looks like a Mochi, so <laughs> like matcha, uh, matcha Mochi. So yeah. Um, uh, she will be also sharing some tips and advice for OSPOS during the whole presentation. So, okay, uh, the first one, um, OSPOCON e Yokoso, uh, welcome to OSPOCON. Um, I would like to give a big shout out to all our program uh, committee that helped to uh, have these talks. Uh, and also to our community supporters, Open Chain and to the group that make, made possible the OSPO contract and all the presentations and great speakers involved. Um, and saying that, uh, let's move now to the core of this talk. Uh, so I would like to start giving you some context of the OSPO evolution. Uh, how has it been involved over the years and why is important. So to start with, I will ask you a, quick, a short question. So what do you think uh, the risk are right now if organizations do open source in the wrong way, so incorrectly? 
maybe 10 years ago, that question will be easy to us. Maybe you will say, well, uh, yeah, we, I know it's important, but we are not using so much open source, or so maybe the organization weren't aware. Well, if you now think about this question, um, it has, the, the answer has changed a lot. Because right now, we know the world runs on software, but if we go far beyond that statement, uh, we can also say that right now, software runs in open source. In fact, 78% um, of modern applications right now, approximately, uh, contain open source components uh, based on the recent study uh, done by Sonotype. Uh, so this is good. I mean, I think open source is great. It uh, creates uh, enhanced innovation, uh, faster time to market. It's, it's a, if organizations know how to take care of open source and how to use and give back to open source, it can be a really powerful tool. Uh, but sometimes uh, the problem is that organizations start using open source with no care, and that can bring potential risk to the organization and also can damage the open source ecosystem. So that's why I uh, said the, later, the other statement. Uh, so the problem some is not open source. Open source is really good tool, but um, organizations need, need to understand how to use it and uh, why it's important to not only use it, but contribute to it, uh, and why it's essential uh, for that. Because uh, when interacting, when engaging with open source, I see two ways of doing that. Uh, the first illustration is um, ad hoc open source. Um, and as you can see, it's like a mess. It's I have, th there was one, vulner let's imagine, um, I'm working uh, with my engineering team, my engineering team found a vulnerability in an open source project we were using, and we are trying to fix that issue. But we are not, uh, we don't have like a specific place to engage with these open source operations. We don't have processes, we don't have tooling to engage. We just need to fix that issue. And once it's fixed, let's move on, and we don't care any anymore uh, about open source anymore. And then maybe uh, in a few months, the same problem happens and then you're wasting time fixing the same issues over and over and over. So that is ad hoc open source. You have one problem, you fix it, you forget it. But then we have uh, another way of doing open source and engaging with open source that is the strategic open source. So with doing with a strategy on top of all the open source operations, uh, organizations can see the big picture and uh, they have uh, processes and tooling to engage in open source and uh, then it's easier for them to advance in the open source journey. And I think a way to see it this better, uh, I think this graph describes quite well. Um, Think about ad hoc open source as something that, yeah, at the very beginning you, you see that, oh yeah, we have fixed the issue, so it looks like we are getting more into open source, but you're not gonna scale. Like, you're gonna reach the top because you don't have processes and tools, so you will get a stack at some point. Uh, while if you're starting to invest in open source um, and to, and, and the company understands the value of uh, building a strategy on top of the open source operations, uh, at the very beginning, maybe you don't see a lot of uh, benefits. You don't see a lot of, um, of, of, clear, um, of clear advancement because you need to start building like all the processes and policies. But then, if you spend more time, you will see how this exponentially scales. And the vehicle to achieve this strategic open source is sometimes called a NOSPO. 
And I say sometimes because organizations are uh, depending are, are across the regions and the industries, they call it different. I've heard organizations calling it like open source strategic center, uh, open source operations team, um, OSPO or open source office because they don't call, they don't use the word program. But uh, don't think about the name itself, think about like what it means to have an OSPO. Like think about like this is this vehicle that uh, helps to achieve this strategic open source that in my honest opinion I think right now is no longer optional if you want to uh, drive innovation in uh, the tech stack. So what is an OSPO then? Um, it can be described as a central, uh, the central space within organization of all the open source operations that happens. And that means um, taking care of all the strategy around open source, around the processes, the tooling, um, infusing open source to the organization. So how can we bring an open source culture to the organization and ways to um, um, educate the developers and the non-developers to engage with open source communities. Sorry about that. <laughs> and there are four main benefits uh, that an OSPO can have. So uh, one is the culture uh, benefit, so it helps to uh, bridge this gap to, uh, of uh, traditional software practices and um, open source dynamic. It also helps on continuity, so that is more like sustainability of open source in the long term for organization. So remember when you do ad hoc, you maybe spend months or a weeks engaging in open source and then you, the, pro the project dies or the, the task dies. With an OSPO, uh, you ensure your organization has a culture uh, around open source and uh, the program continues uh, in the long term. It's something that is progressive, uh, evolving. Uh, and then uh, tools, because when you are engaging in open source, you need to optimize processes and to adapt the internal tooling or the internal policies and processes you had um, into the open source dynamics that, that maybe sometimes are quite different. Uh, so you, you create new tools or you start using new tools and, and increase this innovation. And uh, finally, education. Uh, a very important task of an OSPO is uh, how to infuse this open source culture within the organization. Uh, that can also be seen as um, adopting inner source principles. So not doing only open source, but how can the organization know how to contribute to a project? Because if they don't know how to do it, even though you have a lot of processes, policies, all the compliance in place, uh, the community is not gonna exist. So um, also wanted to highlight what I mean, what I said about the OSPO life cycle. It's not a program that has an end, a, a, a beginning and an end, but it's a program uh, that it's continuous because open source, it's evolving. The tooling you're using today might not be the tooling you're using in, a week, in, in some weeks or in a year. Um, and you need to be innovating in a con constantly. So, the open source continuous innovation and the OSPO should be there all the time. Um, so to also give you some data and some context, this comes from the uh, ladies OSPO survey we do at Tutu Group. As I, rem uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, the Tutu Group that, uh, works in a lot of resources and some of them, one of them is doing the, OSPO, the annual OSPO survey to get a pulse of the OSPO evolution of, uh, across time. Uh, so we've seen in, in this year that uh, more OSPOs are being created. Uh, it it rises to 50% of respondents. So 50% of respondents say they had an OSPO. 
uh, and that was the highest level in five years. So we can say that OSPOs are being consolidated, at least the creation of them. And uh, we also seen they having, that they're already bringing some benefits. So 65% of organizations that says they are contributing code upstream uh, say that they were formally uh, struck to have, uh, have an OSPO. So we can say also that the majority of those people um, that, that has the OSPO are embracing open, so OSPO can embrace open source sustainability in some point. Okay, so um, we can now move to some challenges and opportunities uh, specific to Asia Pacific. Um, this, uh, I will be sharing the data that we collected from uh, the Open Source Program Office uh, 2022 survey. Um, these slides are right below. Uh, I've also uploaded my slides, I think, in the, um, in the event page in case you want to go and check uh, all the resources I will be sharing uh, during this presentation. Um, you can see that even though we got uh, the, um, the 37 percent of uh, our um, at, uh, our, of our um, people said they were from the United States, and then the second most um, the second most um, area was from Europe. We can say like the third one, 90 percent of respondents came from Asia Pacific. So. These are some of the demographics uh, from, the, from the survey, uh, from the uh, data we will be sharing. So let's first start with the opportunities. Um, the first opportunity is that in Asia Pacific OSPOs, we discover that there are more, the, the values is well perceived. Like organizations know, or at least more organizations know that OSPOs are important, and so there is an opportunity to create new OSPOs in this region compared with other regions, for instance. And there might be also more room to grow. Uh, we, one of the questions we asked was, how long ago was the program or initiative established to those organizations that had an OSPO? And we've seen that um, organizations in the Asia Pacific were, were pretty uh, new, most of them, to, to this, so only from, uh, they started like two years ago, one year ago. So this means they, um, they, they have room to grow. There is a lot of path, uh, uh, there is a long path to follow, and uh, they can start from the very beginning and start implementing uh, the, uh, the right um, practices uh, from the very beginning and advance on that. Um, about the challenges, um, when asking what was the main problem, the main issue when organizations, when, wh why, do you, why organizations didn't have an open source program, uh, we, f we found that uh, those organizations that were headquartered in Asia Pacific um, were twice as likely as the average organization uh, to um, want a program, but not be, but doesn't, didn't have the time and resources to justify that. So time and resources seems to be um, the top one challenge, the top one problem in Asia Pacific organizations. Um, also, talent requirements. Um, Asia Pacific Hospital said that finding and requiring open source developers, developers was the main challenge. Uh, compared, like for instance, in, in Europe, that's because we also like uh, segmented in different areas in Europe, we found it was mostly like the, the funding for an OSPO. But in, in Asia, we found that it was uh, more like the, the talent requirement uh, problem. Of, of that and how I, I just wanted to highlight like how important it is to invest on training and education uh, to build more open source experts and and people that are um, 
has knowledge in open source. And um, also, the organization's size was a big problem. Um, because organizations in Asia Pacific thought that um, because their organization is small, uh, the OSPO wasn't for them. Um, I, I don't see this as a challenge, to be honest, so I will be explaining why I think also small organizations can have an OSPO. Uh, but let's, let's move forward, because I will explain in the next slides. Um, yeah, uh, also I wanted to highlight, so we ask the primary responsibilities of the open source program initiative and, and we divide it group in different categories uh, and I was just curious to see that implementing inner source practices and foster open source culture uh, drop from uh, the uh, 2020 survey to the 2022. And I think that might be also a challenge because, as I said, you can have all the open source compliance in place and uh, all the processes and the strategy in place, but if your teams and your organizations doesn't know how to collaborate, doesn't know how to contribute upstream, and doesn't have this culture, or um, this open source culture, the community is not going to grow. You will get stuck in one layer and you won't advance. So I just wanted to highlight like, hmm, that's weird, like why, why it has dropped? So just, just for, for you to be aware. Okay, and now let's move to the longest part of the presentation that are recommendations. Um, so to explain this present, to, to explain this section, um, in Twitter group, we said something every time. So one size does not fit all. What does it mean? So uh, your OSPO is not my OSPO. And what we cannot do is to create some kind of template that covers everything because the OSPO chains, depending on the size, depending on the industry and, and the region even. So um, what we do at the group is we try to build best practices and uh, share learnings that how all the OSPOs are doing so people can take those templates and adapt and find their way. So when sharing these recommendations, don't see it as a, I need to do this to have an OSPO. Think more about as a template that you can change if you think it's important, if you think it, some parts fit for organization and other parts doesn't fit too. Um, so for those organizations that doesn't have an OSPO yet, uh, this is, uh, I found this uh, last week in the uh, Linux Foundation Japan webpage and I didn't know that this existed because in the English version it's not uh, and I was like, oh my god, this is super helpful. So. Um, these are some of the questions that are useful to ask when building an OSPO uh, and that can uh, help your organization to see uh, if it's the right time to build one or if it needs uh, or where, how to start building one at least. So for instance, right now can you finally fi financially support it or uh, do you have someone in your organization to lead it or you need to outsource or you need to hire? A new person for that role? Um, is it possible to work with existing open source projects? Um, can the project be launched and maintained by the open source models or do you need to adopt first internal practices uh, to open source dynamics uh, and if you need further work on that before uh, start contributing and maintaining open source projects? Um, what do you consider successful? Like how can you adapt, how can you align the business objectives or the organization's objectives uh, with, the, with the OSP and the open source uh, program? Um, is the project right now as it is capable of attracting external participation or do you need to start building a community from scratch? 
And uh, last but not least, is there enough uh, interest outside the organization uh, to grow a community of developers? Or do you need to uh, build some guidelines, documentation, and best practices to um, enhance all the people to contribute to your project? Uh, so once we have those questions, um, we can start thinking about how to start servicing an OSPO. And I, I think I came up with this idea of the minimum viable OSPO uh, get, that can help organizations to, okay, maybe I don't have a lot of resources, maybe my organization is not a huge organization, but these are like the three, four things that I should be doing um, and uh, that I don't really need like a lot of resources to start doing it um, to start building the minimum viable OSPO. So the first thing is to find an OSPO leader, to find someone that can lead this program. Um, so when thinking about the role, it's not a, more about like building a team, like thinking about how many people do I want, but think about like the skills that that OSPO leader uh, might be having. Maybe you can hire uh, five people with different skills or one single person that has multiple skills and, and, and has knowledge on different fields, for instance. Uh, there are different roles and as I said, your organization doesn't need to have all of them. Just prioritize, given like right now the, the organization's challenges and what you were thinking when starting the OSPO, what roles are the most important right now for your organization? Select those roles and start defining the ideal uh, OSPO leader for your organization. Uh, then once you have your OSPO leader, you can start thinking about um, how to structure your OSPO. There are different, there is not just one way to structure an OSPO. Um, these are some of them. As you can see, these are more like corporate-based uh, OSPO, but just imagine your organization is, uh, came from the public sector or for governments. Uh, I'm sure there is other ways to structure it. As I said, one, si one size does not fit all. So um, you can have a virtual OSPO and a start a small or no official OSPO and then see how it evolves. Or maybe for the large company, having a corporate level OSPO or a, um, a full OSPO team outside uh, the, um, the other departments, for instance. Um, and think about when building this structure in the organizational variables, like what is the organization culture and values, the goals, and the size and teams. And even though whether they live in one or in one place or another, also think that OSPOs are cross functions So the, the OSPOs are not siloed. They should be working in, uh, and communicate across different departments. That is the most important part. Um, and finally, uh, res define the responsibilities of the OSPO. Uh, that I didn't share. Okay, so I missed one slide. Uh, so if you go to OSPO mind map, if you type on Google OSPO mind map, you will see that we have in the tutor group, we have a mind map that serves all the different responsibilities of an OSPO that can be, that there are like 15 or 10 responsibilities. Uh, and the same happens that the, when finding an OSPO leader, you don't need to have all, like the OSPO doesn't need to take care of all of them, but prioritize uh, where are the top, the core ones, uh, and the ones that are most needed right now. And then as the OSPO grows, the OSPO can start having more responsibilities. So uh, during all this process, there is something really important that the OSPO should be covering all the time that are uh, to, uh, be aware of how to resolve the challenges that are gonna happen while having this OSPO that can be uh, divided into culture, tolling, process, and continuity. Um, so around culture and education, the challenge around culture and education, the OSPO should be 
uh, find ways to improve transparency between departments. So how can not be working siloed, but also be working um, um, across other departments and transmit the value of OSPOs in other departments. Um, also to educate the teams uh, into the ideals of meritocracy, so uh, how to engage in communities, uh, not only for the developers, but also maybe to train, uh, find ways to train stakeholders and managers to understand how to engage in open source, the value of open source, um, and overall uh, build mentorship programs and adopt inner source principles that can ease uh, this uh, cultural change and adoption. Um, around processes, so this is uh, find ways to modify internal policies if it's needed. So for instance, if our organization come from a traditional environment uh, that they are not really um, know how to engage in open source, maybe they need to change some policies to adapt them to the dynamics of open source and try to set up simple internal approval models that doesn't take ages to um, have approval uh, from, from the organization uh, to upstream contributions, to enable upstream contributions. And of course have an open source compliance ready uh, in place to avoid legal problems in the future. Around tooling is around identifying and implement uh, inf and tooling infrastructure to automate process and support open source dynamics. And uh, last but not least, continuity. Uh, so that is more like sustainability or sustainability. So how to inform stakeholders and also uh, the uh, sponsors of that OSPO um, and keep them informed of updates. Uh, this is more to ensure that the OSPO doesn't die. So as I said, the OSPO shouldn't be working um, siloed, but they need to report. So that's why metrics, I think, are it's really important in this place for OSPO sustainability, because it allows to have um, data in place to share to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes one of the challenges of the OSPO is Okay, so I speak one language in my team, in the, let's say, engineering team, but for marketing, they, it's really difficult to communicate with them because they are speaking a different language. Well, data, it's universal. With the data, you can communicate. So I think having a, um, a metrics strategy in place for the OSPO can help to communicate with other teams and of course with the stakeholders and the, and the sponsors uh, of this project. Um, so there is another thing. So once we have the OSPO, this uh, minimum viable OSPO, some organizations said, well, this is not enough. We just need more clear path to go and to keep moving forward. So in the Twitter group, we develop a model um, that can help some organizations uh, to advance. Uh, but please take, uh, you should know that this is not just one model for all organizations. So for instance, this model fits really well for those organizations that are really, uh, came from traditional environments. And for instance, they are, they are not using open source. I mean, they are using open source, but they don't know how to engage with open source. They don't have tooling in place to engage with open source. Um, so that's why this model fits quite well with them. But there are different templates, and there should be different models uh, for different uh, types of OSPs across organizations. So please, when thinking about this, um, journey, adapt and find your way. Um, and this model uh, is divided into four different stages uh, and also the, the serious stage that will be ad hoc open source. And we will be uh, serving, um, I, I'm not going to get into detail about this one in this talk, uh, 
but in overall uh, what this model explains is that as the OSPO level keeps growing, the ability to execute and to uh, engage in open source grows as well. And uh, initially, many OSPOs from traditional environments uh, starts uh, uh, within the legal part and the legal states uh, with legal education. So this is about providing open source compliance, inventory, and developer education in the legal context. And once all these uh, procedures and processes are in place, is when uh, the OSPO can start thinking about how to uh, build education around community. So how can we train the organization like developers and other teams to contribute upstream open source? Um, how to evangelize open source use and be open source first, uh, and how to drive this participation. And once the community knows, uh, the, the developers knows how to contribute to open source, maybe start encouraging them to participate to open source projects and, to, and how to uh, build leadership roles in the community. Um, and then in the engagement part, is when maybe the organization can start hosting their own open source projects and growing open source communities from the projects they, uh, they uh, open sourced. And finally, the leadership. Uh, once the organization really has a deep understanding of open source and a deep contribution of open source, is when the OSPO can become this uh, strategic decision-making partner of the organization and can uh, advise the CTO and advise the engineering team to which tech stack they should be adopting, which tech stack they should be contributing to, uh, and how the different teams to be open source first. Um, so these are some of the, um, some, some recommendations as well uh, that um, overall explains what I've said during the past one's presentation. So one size does not fit all. Um, focusing first on these responsibilities that are top priority, even though there is a wide range of responsibilities out there that the OSPO can do for you, doesn't mean that you need to take them all at once. You can just start first, uh, start small, and focus on maybe one, two, or three responsibilities first. And also, uh, I think this is important, don't get lost in compliance. I've heard so many organizations that they said, we have been having the OSPO for 10 years. Well, I, I heard one, one OSPO that said, we have been having an OSPO for 10 years, and we are really great on all the compliance part. We have all the processes, all the legal are perfect. And the processes on uh, maybe, um, at, um, accepting uh, certain projects or not are great, but we don't have a community. Like the, the developers doesn't contribute to open source because they didn't understand open source. So it's important to, uh, during the whole process, think about this education challenge that I mentioned, uh, because if not, you can get lost in compliance. Um, so uh, also, just to uh, end up with, uh, about to do. Uh, so we are, as I said, we are more than 80 organizations that are supporting to the group and more than uh, 1,800 OSPO practitioners um, that has been helping uh, to create these resources that I've been sharing with you uh, and also collaborating with other open source communities that are helping OSPOs, like for instance, OpenChain or Inner Source Commons or XPDX um, that we collaborate with them. Uh, also to, uh, to enhance this cross-community collaboration and build better resources together. Um, the Tutor Group is specialized in five areas mainly. Mm -hmm. So tooling research, like for instance, the OSPO survey uh, falls in the research side. Uh, network, we have a lot of networking spaces. Uh, we are now starting like local chapters, OSPO local chapters, and, and across different regions to meet, to try to untangle uh, different challenges uh, depending on the region. Training, like we have an OSPO 101 course, and education. 
Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so we have different, have like the global user groups, like for instance, uh, virtual os astrology webinars, the OSPOCON events, and uh, then for the general members, we have someone that we call the touch points, and then we have uh, regional and local user groups in Europe, in APAC, we have the Aspology Live Europe uh, that we are having every three months in different areas in Europe, and OSPO local meetups. And also, uh, for those that are willing to know how to contribute to Tudo and its resources, we have contribution working groups uh, in EMEA and APAC time zone, and also in AMAR time zone. So that is the Aspology community, and all of that is uh, People can free and join free and, and happy to, uh, to to join this our Slack channel and say hi. Um, resources that I've been serving during these presentations, you can find it in these slides. And if you go to all of these links, you will get directed to the to the right specific resource. And that's all. I think we have some time for questions. Um, and if you are afraid to ask, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can you explain more about the API of the OSPOR as an organization? Because, you know, if you have some dedicated group or quarter group get around the organization, the OSPOR should be evaluated in yearly report and right? Mm -hmm. So then what, what's going to be the KPI in this case? I mean, KPIs depends on the organization's goals. Like, first, you need to ask, sit with the stakeholders maybe, and all the departments and say, okay, how do you, how are you measuring your work? And then with that, maybe you need to build different KPIs for each team. Yeah, because the, mm. the, the, one of the, the biggest difficulty of our day, mm -hmm. having not seen business value in some major, you know, obstacle for the creating obstacles. So, yeah. so business value, you don't have, you don't have business value to create a new group. Mm -hmm. It's quite impossible for them, for the marketing to, to create some graphing. Yeah. So that business value or what, what this group can add to value mm -hmm. for their business, for their company. That's very important. Yeah, and I think, so building a roadmap and uh, having clear milestones on each of these um, stages are going to help you to define those KPIs, and I think reporting is so important. Um, for instance, in the chaos community that is focused on community health analytics, one of the methodology we use is the goal question metric approach, and that can work like once you have defined a milestone, let's say, so in one year period we need to, um, we, we would like to contribute X number of times to a project. So uh, that you need to ask some questions and with those questions you can define metrics and that can help you with the reporting. But as I said, I don't have the answer so uh, because it depends on the organization. I, I don't know what are your organization's goals. Only the people involved in the OSPO can know that. How about, how about Toyota? Toyota, you, you said that. Toyota has OSPO, right? Uh, so Europe? Toyota, company Toyota. Ah, Toyota, the, okay, yeah. How Toyota evaluates their OSPO uh, performance? Uh, I don't know that. Oh, I mean, okay. they only know <laughs> that they are the ones that know us. No, normally, so when we have uh, this network in the spaces and talk about that, th those are under Chatham's house rules. So we can share the information, but we, can, we cannot say who says that. So. Okay. Uh, I mean, so the data we have is 
I think it was more than three companies, but um, this is the first year we. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So we, I mean, the data is public. So if you go yeah, to, yeah, I, I and you can take that data and try. I, I think there was one question. I, I, I need to check, but because I, I don't know if we ask for exact like region or we ask like, are you from Asia Pacific? Maybe for the next um, year survey, what we can ask is, tell me where are you based? Like where are you headquartered in terms of country? And with that, we can have uh, like more uh, segmented data uh, for that. Okay, and, uh, I want to say uh, uh, many people here mm -hmm. are interested in how about that is a great idea I really appreciate your feedback and I think it can perfectly done actually um, so we have in the Chitu group we have like a discussion forum and in there the community can propose like can send proposals so if you think there is enough of interest you can document that and share the proposal and uh, we can of course have like some kind of mini series like OSPA survey mini series focused on the specific regions and if the Japanese market is interested, I think that can also benefit uh, the OSPO ecosystem overall. So thanks a lot for the feedback. Uh, do you have any plans to do such a uh, high-resolution survey? Such a, uh, so do you have any plans about the survey focusing on the Japan market? Or uh, right now, we don't have it. Have but it. Oh. Uh, this, this year, spring, uh, spring uh, we did the official Japan Survey. And uh, so we asked uh, several questions about uh, do you have uh, OSPO, dedicated OSPO, or a virtual OSPO, or something. And uh, we collected uh, about uh, 40 or 50 uh, answers. So you can, you can ask, uh, ask this. This data is open. So you, you can. You can Share with Chen, and so uh, perhaps we, we can collaborate with the team there. Yeah, as I said, like we can um, collaborate and we can have uh, something better for the next year with other communities. Yeah, Arigatou gozaimasu.